Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're just going to give it a few minutes to to let everybody come into the session. Sorry about my pinging phone. That's the admin side of the conference. Brilliant to see so many of you here already. Everyone's got amazing bird song in the brand. That's a lovely sort of hold music. Um, <laughs> might be mine. They might be. They might be South African birds. Amazing. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're just giving it a few seconds for everybody to come into this session. We're on 97 at the moment, 99. And 100. Yay! <laughs> Fantastic. I think the numbers are stabilizing a bit. So I'm, I'm just going to start us off. Um, for those of you that, that haven't seen me so far in the conference, my name is Victoria. I'm the exec director of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. Um, I'm a middle-aged white woman. I'm wearing a green polo neck jumper and I'm wearing glasses and I've got short hair and excessively large um, micro... What are these things called? that you've got on headphones. There you go. I've lost my vocabulary completely. Anyway, it's great to, to have you all here. Um, and before I introduce you to your chair for this first panel, Helen uh, I'm just going to do a couple of tech things. A quick reminder about the help desk. If you've got any technical problems, or if you find that anything comes up in this panel that you'd like to have a conversation about, whether it's personal or professional, just contact the help desk delegate, who you will find under the people tab under... Um, direct chat and that will connect you to our colleague Tabore and she'll um, give us a shout and we can come and meet you at table 25 for a conversation or you can email us but it might take a little bit longer to get back. So the panel's going to be in two halves, we'll have a short break in the middle. Um, we have some creative bursts which are set up on the uh, general um, notice board padlet that you're welcome to do during the break or you might just want to get away from the screen for a few minutes. Helen is going to be inviting questions from you a bit later. If, if you want to ask a question of our panellists, please do use the questions tab or the Q&A tab, depending on how it appears to you. You can also raise your hand, and Helen might invite some of you to, to join us on the stage if you do that. Um, if we get lots of people raising their hands, we might ask some of you to write your questions in just for time. But we'll see how we go with that. You can react, you can send emojis to us, um, and you can change the view at the bottom of your screen in, this, in a similar way to how you would on, on Zoom. Uh, we're recording this session, and we'll share that in the Culture and Health Inequalities booth and via the Padlet as soon as we can after the session. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to our chair for today, Helen Chatterjee. Professor Helen Chatterjee is a professor of biology at UCL Biosciences and UCL Arts and Sciences. Her research includes evidencing the impact of natural and cultural participation on health. She co-founded the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, so is one of the reasons that we're here, really. And she's an advisor to the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Arts and Health. She chairs the Royal Society for Public Health's Special Interest Group in Arts and Health. And she's a founding trustee for the National Centre for Creative Health. You can find out about all these organisations on the general information padlet, by the way. Her disciplinary research has won a range of awards, including a special commendation from Public Health England for Sustainable Development. Most recently, she won the 2018 AHRC Welcome Health Humanities Medal and Leadership Award. She received an MBE in 2015 for services to higher education and culture. Helen has written four books, Touch in Museums, Policy and Practice in Object Handling, Museums, Health and Wellbeing, Engaging the Senses, Object-Based Learning for Higher Education, material connections from objects learning to object-based well-being and over 50 research articles so she's generally quite intimidating um over to you helen and i'll come back at the end of the session blimey thank you for that lovely introduction victoria it's such a pleasure to be here my name's helen i'm a mixed race female in her late 40s um i wear spectacles i've got mid-length 
brown, slightly graying hair, and uh, I've got a, a black and white stripy top on for you today. And it's such a great pleasure to be chairing today's session on inequalities. So just a little bit of background on our logistics for our session today. We've got six fabulous speakers for you today, uh, and it's my great pleasure to, to be chairing the session. The logistics are we're going to be hearing for, from our panellists in two parts. We're going to have three uh, speakers back to back and then we're going to move into some questions from you so please as you start listening to our speakers think about your questions start posting them in the Q&A section which you should see on the right of your screen or as Victoria says you can raise your hands and I'll do my best to get uh, to many of you and invite you to the stage to address uh, the panel directly then we'll have a short break of around five minutes a loose stop uh, or a cup of tea stop and um, then we'll come back and we'll hear from our next three set of speakers and have the same format uh, to wrap up on 3.30. So I hope that sounds all right. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing all of you and from our fantastic speakers who are here today to tackle the issue of health inequalities and explore how arts and culture uh, plays a role in supporting and see health and equity. Of course, we're now much more familiar with the term health inequalities due to the COVID pandemic. We know that um, the COVID pandemic has adversely and disproportionately affected vulnerable members of society. For example, those who are experiencing physical, psychological or socioeconomic vulnerabilities have been much more adversely affected. So quite simply, the pandemic has been worse for poorer people living in poorer areas which are asset depleted and are much more deprived. And that is linked to what we know about these wider, what we call social determinants of health that we know from the work of Michael Marmot and others. So um, these concepts that are not necessarily new to many of us in this space, but what we're really interested in today is thinking about how arts, culture and health can work together to address issues of inequality. So what we did is ask each of our panellists to address our challenge, these two challenges that we've got, culture and health, and how can we bring these two spaces together to foster greater equity. So it's on that note, I'd like to introduce our first of our three speakers. You've just heard from him, uh, a fantastic presentation from Baby J. So I'm going to hand over to Baby J, co-founder of Baby People. He's gonna introduce himself and tell you a bit more about their work. So thank you over to you, Baby J. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to keep my introduction reasonably brief because if anyone was in the last thing, you've just heard it. Um, but my name is Baby J. I'm the Managing Director of Baby People. Um, for audio description, I'm a white male in my mid-40s. I'm wearing a white t-shirt and I've got a bald head. Um, I, the Baby People is a hip-hop school. We've been running for 20 years and we use hip-hop culture and black music as a way of re-engaging young people who have kind of fallen out of love education. Um, and I think that the interest for me today with, with this discussion and the panel is, is really um, the opportunity that the arts bring to engage around health. Because for me, two things are interconnected and interlinked. Um, it was really interesting when we first started as an organization that often we'd approach schools or talk to schools and they'd be like, they'd look at what we were offering as a reward for good behavior, kind of like, yeah, you know, if they're working, then they can do this thing with you, as opposed to it actually being, having some intrinsic benefit with the, within itself. And I think the, that has changed over time, but I still think it's on a journey. And I think our argument is with schools, actually this way of learning inefficial for young people's health and for their sense of self and their confidence and for their journey as, as people that can contribute and be part of society as opposed to it just being a fun add-on and i think you know the arts have been long recognized as their therapeutic benefit but often within education especially it's looked at as how do we use the arts to fix a problem you know when, when someone might have already got to the stage where they're struggling with something and i think what what we're passionate about in baby people and what we like to explore and what i'm interested in hearing other people's opinion on is is the ability of the arts and music to tackle you know the, the way people learn and the way they see themselves and the way they take part with their peers and in education school in society so they don't end up feeling that they're not part of something they don't end up with mental health problems and stigmas and you know and get to the stage where we're looking at a pharmaceutical answer for a problem that might have been dealt with by someone having more of a sense of themselves um, or given that opportunity to have a sense of themselves through 
you know, something like the arts at an earlier stage. So I'm sorry if that's waffling a little bit. I'm talking before I'm introducing myself, <laughs> but that's what I'm kind of passionate about, or what we're passionate about people. And I'm, you know, keen to hear uh, the other panelists and, and they have to say what they Fantastic. Thank you, Baby J. Really appreciate that. And it was so fantastic hearing your, about more about your work earlier. So next up, I'm pleased to introduce Sandra Griffiths. M many of you will know the fantastic work that she and colleagues do at the Red Earth Collective. So I'm delighted to welcome Sandra and over to you, Sandra. Hello. Um, really pleased to be here. Thank you, Helen, um, for introducing me. Um, uh, my name's Sandra Griffiths and I'm an uh, African-Caribbean woman, uh, late 50s. Uh, I've got locks which are in a, a petal style uh, and I'm wearing um, a very bright yellow top uh, with blue splashes uh, on um, and I'm wearing glasses. I think they're purple. Yeah, they're purple. Um, so that's who I am. And um, as Helen said, I'm the director for the Red Earth Collective, which uses the arts to stimulate conversations about mental health and well-being, particularly targeting um, racialized and marginalized communities. And um, I guess what I want to do, hopefully in five minutes, is to share a little bit of my journey in using the arts in, in my work, not just at Red Earth, which uh, became a community interest company three years ago, but I've actually been around for quite a while doing this work. Um, so over the last 25 years, if I'm honest, probably nearly 30, but <laughs> 25 years, uh, I've worked on a number of um, strategies and initiatives trying to tackle racial mental health inequalities, um, particularly focusing on um, African and Caribbean communities who um, are either vulnerable to or have a range of mental health uh, problems, some are diagnosed, some not. And I've worked nationally as well as in London and in the Midlands where I now live. Um, and as part of that work, I've um, co-produced primarily with black artists from different genres, drama, spoken word, uh, writers, um, poets, musicians, Many of those um, artists have a lived experience of mental health problems. And drawing on my own mental health problems, we've created um, workshops and productions. I've produced a couple of um, drama uh, productions around the mental health, and the mental health experience of, of black men and black women. Um, and often, be, I've been commissioned to, to produce some of these productions. More recently with Red Earth, we have um, been more proactive in engaging with the community and um, the ideas for the productions have come from the community. But where we have been commissioned by mental health staff, um, ment uh, what we have found is a similar scenario which some of you will be familiar with. So uh, typically, we probably about 10 years ago, we would have been invited, Black History Month is around the corner. Oh, Sandra, could you come in and do an activity that engages with African Caribbean um, clients on our wards? Or um, outside of the Black Month, uh, Black uh, History Month, we might have been invited because there's a new race inequality strategy initiative which has amplified that oh my god goodness we have a problem here in our service and it's either black service users are not engaging with um, treatment or activities um, or there's been a complaint from a black service user about the treatment that they've received black service users um, are will say that they're either bored um, or that what's being offered isn't culturally appropriate or relevant on a number of levels, not just in terms of culture, sometimes in terms of age and gender, etc. And in the, the kind of development of a response to uh, those concerns, those issues, um, we often have started the process of creating uh, um, activities using the arts um, by having a conversation 
with the staff. So often staff would tell us what the issues are <laughs> and we hear that, but we then invite conversation with the um, participants, the uh, clients on the ward. And what I'm wanting to exp I'm exploring um, at the moment at Red Earth is the work that we've done, particularly in um, settings, mental health settings, like medium secure units, where um, some of the participants kind of uh, liberties have been uh, restricted. Um, there's, a, there's a challenge there of bringing into that space a cre creative activity. Um, when we have um, delivered creative activity into those spaces, we've discovered a number of, of, of things which I think are really important and I think speak to some of the inequalities uh, that black people face outside but also within those um, facilities. And one is um, that this sense of, of agency that create, creating a space where people can ex use creativity to express themselves gives people a sense of agency that they may not always experience in those facilities. The other kind of key theme for us is reminding people of their strengths and assets. Often in those spaces, you can forget <laughs> Um, that you have skills and you have abilities and you also can forget that you have a history and through creative activities we have enabled people to be reminded of their strengths and their assets and their history and their wider context they're not just people with um, lived experience with mental health problems and that speaks to the other theme of looking at other identities there's an opportunity that we have we explored with participants in our workshops, in our activities, to explore other identities that they hold. So hold, hold an identity around their race, around their culture, uh, but there are other identities, parents, son, daughter, you know, artist. And we create spaces that allow people to explore that, to name that sometimes. So those are some of the issues that I, I've become quite interested in. And the work that uh, we're doing that explores these themes in our creative um, activities and endeavours chimes with some work that we've done using the narrative therapeutic methodology, the Tree of Life, which is a, a tool which I find incredibly powerful because it, it enables through a metaphor of a tree um, using that tree, helping people to draw a tree, it asks the kinds of questions that people rarely get asked <laughs> in mental health services. Who are you? <laughs> what are your strengths? What are your aspirations? What are your hopes and what are your dreams? These are themes and issues which sometimes get forgotten or not asked about in, in those kinds of settings. And it also values people's roots and heritage. Uh, which I think is also important. So um, I've probably gone over my five minutes, um, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit of insight into some of the themes and issues that are emerging from the work that we're doing using um, a range of different uh, creative activities. And I welcome the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit more about the impact of those activities and the impact of those conversations got a ripple effect on the organisation more widely. Fantastic. Thank you, Sandra. I, I too hope we can pick up some fantastic themes you've raised there. So thank you. And on to our final speaker from this panel, uh, first panel, um, Matt Mahoney probably doesn't need any more uh, introduction than that. I'm sure many of you know John and the great work he does at Arts Council. So over to you, John. Too kind. Thanks, Helen. Uh, so, hi everyone. I'm John. I'm Arts Council England's national lead for health and well-being. Uh, I'm a, regrettably I'm a newly middle-aged white man. Uh, I'm wearing a pale blue shirt and red sweater. I've got glasses on, uh, shortish dark blonde hair, and a beard. So I probably look a bit like a kiwi fruit uh, on your screens at the moment. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Really glad to be here alongside other fellow speakers and. 
thanks for joining us. I hope you're all well wherever you're zooming in from or air meeting in from. Um, firstly, I don't want to cheat, but the, the session question implies a, a really clear separation between culture and health, and I'd like to challenge that a little bit. There's extensive evidence that health inequalities and cultural inequalities correlate really strongly. We know that the people and communities that face the greatest barriers to accessing healthcare will face similar distance from cultural engagement and indeed access to other services, including, for example, education and training and legal and housing support. All of these are underpinned by a set of fundamental social determinants, including income, socioeconomic status more broadly, prior educational attainment, current employment, the region that you live in, and a range of other characteristics, including ethnicity and disability. In many respects, I think we could extend the frame that currently sits around the social determinants of health to talk of the social determinants of marginalisation. If we go a bit sort of further out into more romantic or kind of historically speculative territory, many might discern a shared sort of tangled roots of medicine and art and indeed even religion and magic in ancient ritual, focusing more practically and on the present we don't tend to talk of a separation between sport and physical activity and health or diet health. We recognize that these other fundamental aspects of human activity are intertwined. So in this context, a really interesting question to pose ourselves collectively is, how do we get to the same point of widely held common sense understanding of the value of creativity and culture for well-being? as is presently the case for exercise or good diet. We're looking for solutions, so a couple more things I'd like to chuck into the mix briefly. The Arts Council's new 10-year strategy called Let's Create very clearly embeds health and well-being as key contributions that the arts, museums and libraries can offer to individuals and to communities. And it outlines our strategic priorities in terms of advancing uh, that. So. In Do This in Isolation, though, the, the strategy also explores the ways that the arts and culture can create agency in a sense of possibility, how the arts can foster understanding and better connect people both to each other and to the services that exist in their communities, how the arts and culture can support young people's educational attainment, routes to further study, training and employment, uh, not only within the creative industries, but far beyond how arts and cultural organisations and infrastructure can contribute to economic growth and extended employment opportunities on the basis of place. And crucially, how we diversify our sector to make sure that all communities have equal access and have their voices represented from employment opportunities at all levels uh, to um, the commissions and at all scales and the perspectives shared and the audiences welcomed by our collective creative programming. In short, we're thinking right across that wider range of the aforementioned social determinants. Speaking more practically still, we need to foster local and national partnerships, collaboration and shared understanding, not only between culture and healthcare practitioners and organisations, but with other sectors too, including sport, natural environment and the wider voluntary faith, community and social enterprise sector. One of the ways that we're currently attempting to do this is through the Thriving Communities Fund, which is our new partnership with the National Academy for Social Prescribing and also Historic England, Natural England, NHS England, Sport England, the Money and Pension Service, the Office for Society and NHS Charities together. We're supporting 12, uh, sorry, 37 projects over the next 12 months to bring together partnerships across all of those sectors to devise and deliver social prescribing activities, particularly focused on those experiencing health inequalities and the harshest impacts of the pandemic, to build the evidence base for social prescribing and to work with commissioners to explore longer term financial sustainability. These projects currently feature over 200 partners and are seeking to reach over 8,000 participants or community referrals. This offers a great platform for closer joint working and planning between health, culture and these wider partners. And that's just one of the key steps that we'd like to carry forward and further broaden in order to the needs of all communities uh, by marshalling the health, cultural and other sectors to work together. So really looking forward to picking up the discussion. Thanks again for, for joining. Awesome, thank you, John. And thanks to all of our three panelists, brilliant so far. I just want to take this opportunity just to 
give a shout out and say hi to our other three panellists who are here. I'll just quickly introduce them. Esther Fox, who is a visual artist and head of Accentuate UK. We've got uh, Kids Banger. I uh, hope kids can, can see and hear us. She's founding director of Hip Hop Heels and Olatunde Spence, who's a leading art therapist. So thanks to you guys for joining us. You're going to be hearing from them in a minute, but um, I'm going to move now, if that's all right, to have um, 10 minutes or so for some questions. We've already got some questions rolling in. So thank you to our uh, people who've been posting. If anybody wants to raise a hand and ask a question directly, you can do. But our first question, panellists, is from Lucy Cook. She is asking, have any of you worked with museums? And if so, what did that look like? And I know um, several of you have worked with museums. So any of our panelists who want to give a shout out about work you've done with museums? Yeah, well, I don't mind starting. We, um, we've done quite a bit with Derby Museum. And what was quite interesting about the project, essentially they had a lot of artifacts, quite a lot of them of kind of African origin obviously there's a lot of kind of debate and question about how those artifacts ar arrived and as an organization how we felt about that um they were keen to kind of have that stuff displayed but we're also aware that some of the communities they might want to engage with might not traditionally go to the museum so we kind of did a bit of work with them and we took groups of our young people to the museum and they also brought some pieces and mounted them in a safe way in our building where we have young people from lots of different communities all the time and that was quite good because they kind of came and did some work and explained about the pieces but as part of that what was kind of negotiated and agreed was we looked at how those pieces ended up here in England and why they were here and the legacy of that and so forth and so on so we made sure that that was kind of part of the narrative which the museum was fully in favour of and, and worked quite well but it was nice because I think our young people got to experience something that they really wouldn't and I think the museum at that point um, got to um, kind of engage with groups of young people and communities that wouldn't traditionally necessarily have kind of engaged or gone through their doors to see their. Mm. Um, I've got two experiences, um, one more directly than the other. So the first one was with the Tower Hamlets African and Caribbean Mental Health Organization which sadly doesn't exist anymore. Um, but they were actively involved with a um, museum in, in London, I think it was the Docklands Museum, where they um, developed a program called Power Writers. And the, basically they, bec they became researchers and uh, curators. They researched um, black um, figures from the 18th, 19th century in East London, they persuaded, encouraged the Docklands to collaborate with them. They produced a, a publication uh, about the, um, you know, about the history of, of those individuals. So that, that was quite an interesting um, uh, project. Because yes, they were uh, people with a lived experience, but they were positioned as this kind of community researchers. Um, and writers, and that they collaborated with the Docklands Museum to, to produce not only a publication, but also an exhibition of images of, of this historically fit um, figure. So that, I thought that was quite interesting, you know, how they were being positioned outside of their kind of lived experience identity, um, you know, alongside that, that identity. And uh, more recently, um, I did some work with um, in Birmingham with uh, one of the Birmingham museums um, and we curated a uh, Black History Month event uh, that featured uh, a number of artists. So we didn't, it wasn't a, a project that looked at the artifacts in, in the space. It, we used that space. It was, a, you know, they offered the space uh, for us to kind of produce an activity that would engage the community to come into that space and through that they then invited people to kind of look around uh, the space uh, so those have been my two experiences and we're about to do some work subject to funding uh, with uh, the same museum around the Windrush celebrations in June yeah fantastic thank you John I've actually got a question for you next if that's all right 
Um, well, before and... that, Helen, I'd just like to mm. direct people to your brilliant research on museums on prescription with Manchester Museum and Art Gallery, Tyne and Weir Museums and others. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. <laughs> Um, John, I've got a question for you from Angela, really interesting. Um, she says Arts Council Wales have just created a new role, Agent for Change, to make sure that access to its activities, services and funding is fairer and more equal. And she wonders whether ACE have any plans to do similar. Um, big, big question. So I've been really excited to see that as well. Arts Council Wales are doing all kinds of really exciting and interesting things across these spaces they've got quite a, an established scheme as well where they have co-funded posts at the kind of count level health authorities between the arts and health sectors and that's something else that we've looked at and learning a lot from we we work really closely and collaborate with and share ideas with the other uk arts councils and i've actually set up a county regulating just on health and well-being with those other agencies uh, from from earlier in, in lockdown. Um, I can't say that we're definitely going to replicate that exact measure, but my, my colleagues Abid Hussein, who's our director of diversity, and others are looking at all potential measures for how we can advance the objectives that we've set out in Let's Create. So I'm sure they're looking at that as well. Well, thank you. I've got a really good question next uh, for all of you, really, anyone wants to tackle this really interesting from Nick Curtis, um, asking about co-production of health um, is becoming increasingly prominent. Is this a good place framework? Or, oh, it's just slipped down my screen. Come back, Nick. Um, is this a good place framework or which where the arts and health world can uh, intertwine further, connecting people on equal levels where everyone has a role to play? So yeah, I think that co-production of health question, mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? Mm. We talk a lot about health creation, don't we? And, and that's a, a big sort of part of the work that I know that Culture Health and Wellbeing Alliance and through our collaboration with the National Centre for Creative Health. Um, and I, I wonder if, you know, work around integrated care systems and other types of these sort of reframing systems and how um, it might relate to some further discussions we might want to have around kind of what we're interested in is that equity of access, you know, equity of access, both in terms of health system. We know that there's there's great inequity in the way that people access health systems. So again, people from poorer areas who simply don't access those systems. Similarly, also probably not accessing what assets they do have, even if um, they're depleted in those areas. So I wonder if that has something Esther. Yeah, I don't know whether it's my turn to chip in, but um, you can do, I'll, please do. I'll have a go if you like, if nobody else is, is eager to jump. Um, I am going to talk a little bit um, in my presentation in a minute, but I think there's certainly a big room for development of this area, um, working with disabled people together with um, in sort of healthcare settings, because I think specifically disabled people haven't really engaged so much in the arts and health agenda and I think there are quite complex reasons behind that but particularly around this idea of cure and illness and actually many disabled people don't feel that they're ill or they want to be cured so it's much more about an identity issue so I think finding ways to kind of really work together to understand disabled people's identity as being an inherent part of them um, might be a way to think about sort of more co-production in this area. Um, but I'll touch a little bit more on that in my presentation as well. I, I absolutely agree with that, Esther. And I, I think obviously co-production is something that um, creative and cultural sectors have been sort of building up as a, as a form of ever more, more kind of common mainstream practice for a number of years in, in a similar kind of timeline to our journey around health and well-being. One of the reasons I hesitated before is that there's an interesting kind of debate about the way in which co-production can sometimes be inadvertently exploitative <laughs> in terms of, you know, not acknowledging or uh, effectively um, recompensing um, the contribution made by the groups that are being engaged. But navigating those challenges effectively, I think there is a really interesting convergence point between our practice as a sector and what's building parallel around co-production patient choice within the healthcare sector and I'm on the 
steering group for National Academy for Social Prescribing and the Coalition of Collaborative Care, for instance, are reputed on that. National Voices as well. There's a big opportunity around the growing trend towards personalised care in this space and how that meets co-production in both culture and healthcare. I think it's very molten at the moment, so I don't have brilliant examples to, to give, but I think it's a fascinating area for further exploration. Brilliant. Thank you. No, I'm sorry, Helen, can I just chip in quickly, just following on from Esther said, because it kind of there's a real parallel with the you know why we work within hip hop chair. And I think that there's this almost from the arts as a as a sector, there's this kind of thing with something like hip hop culture. And I think it's the same with any kind of challenge in art form of like, oh, you can create art despite the challenges and you know it'll be okay. You know, it'll be of a certain standard. The way we feel is we create the best art because of the challenges. So it's not like, oh, we can probably do it as good as what happens in a gallery or a dance studio, or what happens at one of these schools, these, you know, where wealthy people, no, we're gonna make the best art in the world. We're gonna make something that's gonna shape the way young people respond and feel about themselves around the world. And I think, I think it's reframing the argument. I think it's not kind of saying, well, actually can someone who's got a physical challenge or disability can they make art that's kind of a standard or could we integrate them into no maybe they can make better art than you maybe they can make art that's going to look at the world in a whole new way that's exciting and i think it's i think the arts has a problem and that's that's that the arts has traditionally come from you know big organizations and money and you know prestige and all these things that actually have nothing to do with creativity and actually experience and lived experience has got way more to do with great art than finance, public funding, institution, any of that stuff has. And that's why hip hop to me is the greatest form of music. I appreciate I'm biased because <laughs> of the struggles that hip hop culture has faced. And, and I, I think that's going to go, the, when we look at health, it's exactly the same argument. So I think we've got to start looking at why the, the opportunities that some of these barriers create for great art, as opposed to, just kind of thinking it's a nice add-on or something that maybe can be as good as? Mm. I just want to um, add a couple of things. So, yeah, I hesitated to think about that question because I often wonder what what does co-production mean? <laughs> and that means different things to different people and, maybe, and there's a conversation to be had about how that, how that is defined and, and the kind of... Uh, imbalance that there is and the different players that are part of that conversation about co-producing something and it just made me think about some work I did when I was in London um, where you know it was I think it was 2005 delivering race equality agenda uh, was uppermost in the minds of a lot of mental health trusts um, and my team um, which is called Mela, uh, was invited to be part of the conversation with the trust, even though I was part of the trust, but we were, you know, we were explicitly asked to, to kind of help the organisation think about how it would respond to race inequalities within that trust. And, and um, our response was an artistic one. <laughs> um, an artistic one that involved us consulting with um, many black services to tell us basically how it was, what was their experience of, of the service. And we involved um, some uh, actors and writers in that process of consultation and they captured the themes and issues and we created four short playlets which were called Foresight. And those four um, playlets were then presented back to the organization to stimulate a conversation about this is the experience of this group in your service, yeah? Um, we invited a range of, of, of staff. So we had, you know, from psychiatrists, healthcare assistants, nurses, everyone in between to attend. And there was, you know, it was about 700 staff that, were told they had to attend. So that was an interesting dynamic in itself. <laughs> you know, you will attend this. But um, but it, it enabled a conversation to happen. And that's what I feel about the arts, that it it can enable a you know, an organization to see itself. <laughs> um, 
and to create space to reflect on what they see. And we positioned um, so the service users that we were working with as the facilitators post the production to have a conversation with the staff that watched the, the production about, okay, what next? That You've seen this, let's reflect on what you've seen. So how can you do things differently? Um, is that co-production? Well, there's clearly other stages beyond that, but it was part of the journey. Um, and I, I thought it was a very important part of the journey. And I've learned a lot about kind of how the arts can be used in, in a way that in, enables organisations to have difficult conversations, but also it can be framed as hopeful conversations as well that enables people to think about how can we now act, yeah? Uh, in a way that, you know, a presentation, PowerPoint presentation about these are the stats, these are the issues. There's something very kind of direct um, and very um, immediate about seeing <laughs> production that tells an organisation, this is how you are perceived. And so I'd say it's it's it has an important I found and still think that it has a you know the arts culture has a particular role it can play enable some of those conversations that sometimes happen in spaces that you know um, clients um, and staff don't meet. Yeah. Well, thanks, Sandra. Um, I'm conscious of time, guys, and I want to give you a, a couple of minutes break, but we've had one raised hand, so I wanted to just attempt to bring Karen from Manchester Museum to, to the stage. I hope this is going to work, Karen. I'm not quite sure how to... Let's see if this works. It doesn't look like it is. Sorry, it Karen. Has. No, it I'm has. I'm trying to invite you to the stage. Oh, you are. You are. You're attending. Yeah. Karen, I invite you to ask your question. And maybe if, if one of our panellists can respond to Karen's question. I'll put you on the spot a bit, Karen, but hopefully. Oh, you've disappeared again. Karen, is it all right if I invite you back? Once we've heard from our other three panellists, I will get to you. That sort of worked. It looked like you were you, you were joining <laughs> us then, but then we lost you. So, well, thank you very much to all of our fantastic first three panellists. What I'm going to suggest is that we take a short uh, four minute break, five minute break maximum and come back. It's near quarter two. Um, if we can come back at 10 to at the absolute latest, I suggest that you don't leave the session. Uh, we'll just linger around here and, and our speakers can turn their cameras off if they want to, to nip out and make a cup of tea. And then we'll come back at 14.50 at 50 to hear from our next three brilliant speakers. And then uh, keep saving your questions, thinking of questions, and I'll get to as many as I can. But thank you very much, all of you, so far. And see you again in five minutes. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you're joining us OK. Um, please do keep posting your questions. Lovely to see you, Kiz, Esther and Olatunde. We're going to move into our next set of presentations from our three next fantastic speakers. Uh, so keep thinking about your questions and being inspired to uh, address some of the topics that they're raising. So. First up on my list, Esther, is you, and uh, it'd be great to hear more about your fantastic work. Those of you uh, that didn't hear my introduction earlier, uh, Esther is a visual artist and head of Accentuate UK. And over to you, Esther, to tell everyone more about yourself and your fantastic work. Thanks so much, Helen, and thanks for inviting me today. And wonderful to be part of such a great panel, so thanks so much. Um, for the sake of audio description, I'm in my mid-40s. I've got grey and light brown hair and I'm wearing a white top. Um, I've done a short presentation just really to aid my own thoughts. So I'm going to try and share this with you and I will talk through my slides as I'm showing them again for the sake of audio description. So hopefully you'll be able to see this. OK. So I wanted to respond very, very kind of particularly to the to the provocation, which is about the two problems of culture and health, and um, one being culture and one being health. So um, I wanted to kind of 
look at these two areas and think about, well, actually, are they really that different? Um, so in culture, there is inequality of representation of deaf and disabled and neurodivergent people within our cultural institutions. So I'm really interested through the Accentuate programme and my own arts, arts practice, how we can challenge that underrepresentation and demonstrate an understanding of the value that disabled people bring through this lived experience. And then in health, I would also say there's an inequality of representation of deaf and disabled and neurodivergent people within health settings. In this, what I mean by that is the people that are delivering arts practice within health settings, rather than people obviously accessing health settings. So how can we challenge that representation and demonstrate an understanding of their value? Um, so my next slide. This slide has a picture on the right hand side and the picture is of two women, um, one with different coloured hair, blonde and red, and the other with curly brown hair, looking into a museum display case. And in the background, you can see artifacts on the wall within a museum setting. So although I've said that there are kind of parallel problems, there are also similar solutions. So I think we need to look at ways to open up opportunities for deaf, disabled and neurodivergent people to take a lead role in delivering arts and cultural experiences and promote this value and these unique perspectives and find ways for disabled people to be the catalysts for change across the sector, which is very much what we've been hearing our other panellists speak about earlier, I think. Um, this image was taken from one of our previous projects called History of Place, and we worked with three museums, the Museum of Liverpool, M-Shed in Bristol, and the V&A in London. And we worked with over 100 volunteers to uncover hidden heritage around deaf and disability history over 800 years, looking at eight built heritage sites. And this was the exhibition that we delivered with the Museum of Liverpool. And what came out of that re experience really was that although we'd kind of really done a lot of co-production with disabled people in terms of the research and um, uncovering this heritage, when it came to actually delivering the exhibitions, the people within those museum institutions, we certainly in those instances weren't defining as deaf and disabled when they were in curatorial roles. So we were like, well, how do we then ensure that there's an authenticity to telling these stories if deaf and disabled people aren't in curatorial roles? So off the back of that project, we're now in development of a project called Curating for Change. And we're hoping we've had the development phase funding and we're hoping to get delivery phase funding from Heritage Fund to do that. And we've got 18 museum partners lined up to work with us to deliver a whole range of paid work placements to develop deaf and disabled curators in these museums across England. So that was one way I'd suggest ta tackling the, the challenge within sort of museums. Um, so the other parallel issue is tackling the challenge within art in healthcare settings. So this is an image of um, it's a kind of uh, a space that is like um, looking up to the ceiling with bookcases that curve round and round and round and round and disappear into sort of infinity at the edge. And then there's a portrait that looks like a Victorian man on the uh, left hand corner. Um, and this this piece of work is actually a piece of work that I've created. It's a, a virtual reality art piece that I made in collaboration with other deaf and disabled people that had a lived experience of having a genetic condition and what it was called evolution and it was created as a result of participatory research with deaf disabled people um, and the this artwork really brought together art heritage and medicine and the idea was to really unpack the troubling legacy of eugenics. So this, this image is a still taken from the VR work and it's set in um, Francis Galton's imaginary study. So Francis Galton is known as um, the father of eugenics. And so we, when you go through the experience and you can find this, I, I believe on the Padlet, it's a, a short sort of film that gives you like a promo to have a look at, um, you're asked to make selections of character traits and the idea really is is to show people how quickly people are very happy 
to make choices and categorise people and make value judgments about what one thing seems more valuable than other others and at the end of those choices actually you find out that your all of the choices that you make are unsatisfactory and it's it's not a good idea to make these selections so it's a kind of playful way to try and get people to challenge ideas about this kind of categorization and selection and how we make value judgments on people's lives so and for me that was really important that disabled people had their voice in the debate around genetics because i think there's you know a really big gap there about valuing that lived experience over the medicalized experience of what people think a genetic connection is so that was really the point of creating this this piece of work alongside disabled people's perspectives so my final conclusion really is that i think to bring together these historically unequitable spaces and to foster equality we should challenge previously privileged positions of knowledge e.g the curator or the medic i think we should value the lived experience of deaf disabled and neurodivergent people who bring rich and vibrant perspectives to both our cultural and health environments and find the synergies between what may look like disparate areas to fork out ground different voices and approaches so i'm going to sh stop sharing now and i hope that didn't go on too long that's really brilliant thank you esther for giving such a, a clear and eloquent um outline of it yeah ways forward i think that'd be great if we can pick some of those ideas up so next up, I'm really pleased to welcome Kiz Banger. Uh, Kiz, as you may know, is the, is the founding, is the director of Hip Hop Heels and does uh, some brilliant work. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome her today. And over to you, Kiz, to tell everyone about your work. Hello, everybody. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. And it's great to see all the other panelists and hear more about work. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Sandra because early on in my career um, in therapeutic arts work. So it was a great mentor and advisor and we're still in close contact today. So yeah, her work's amazing and uh, she's a complete role and inspiration. So got a big one, Sandra. Um, <laughs> I, um, I run Hip Hop Heels because I found that there was a complete lack of culturally tailored work around young, young men of colour. So, I uh, lost an older sister in a car accident and her son actually tried to commit suicide when he became an adult. Um, he was only 13 when he was in the car with his mom when she died. So obviously it's very traumatic. And when I when I went that experience with him, he was sectioned. We chatted about hip hop. We chatted about why people can get on the mic and talk about their innermost feelings, but they can't speak to their wives, girlfriends, moms, dads. So in England, there's a suicide epidemic. It kills the, um, it's the biggest killer of young people and men. I, I, I can't understand why there aren't more things out there that appeal to young people and men. So I thought reflectively about my own, you know, interests. I did a master's in creative writing for therapeutic purposes and we, looked at how poetry therapy and music therapy can help expression and reflection. And these are the kinds of things that maybe people need to draw from instead of medication. So in my own experience of going to the doctor, suffering from traumatic grief, complex grief, um, I kept getting offered tablets. And I kept saying, look, I don't need tablets. You know, somebody's died in my family. I, I need some, you know, I need some support to process what's happened. And it was all very sudden. There were lots of circumstances around it that I found really challenging. So I went into shock. And because I repressed all my emotions, I started to realise that perhaps men and perhaps young people don't have a chance to talk. And I certainly felt like I, if I tried to go there in my own emotional space, I felt like I would break as a human being. It was too much for me to tackle. So I kept things in. But music for me has always been the backbone of my life. And my sister that passed loved reggae. We recorded my um, four year old self singing Sister Nancy's Bam Bam. I used to play it back to me as I grew older. And I kept thinking, wow, that was me as a kid. And I, he I heard this kid's voice all the way through and always loved reggae and hip hop. So when I was feeling at my worst, I always used to draw for reggae and hip hop and jungle music from bass music. 
And I saw lots of people around me doing the same. So when I was coming to write my thesis, I started thinking about what can I do to incorporate my culture and all my mates in this arts and health world? So I used hip hop culture. I, I, I started to use the lyrics of reggae and hip hop in my arts and health practice. And I had amazing results. So I worked with people in probation, mental health secure units, homeless hostels, people from the general public. I'm currently um, commissioned by Birmingham City Council to work with young people with disabilities. And if I ask Hayley, please, could you share my screen? Um, Hayley's the, uh, the magic magician. He's be uh, hopefully doing a bit of screen sharing. So yeah, this is, this is our organization. If you could go to the next slide, please, Hayley. So we offer therapy workshops and courses. We have a, a course, so we have a counsellor on our board, so we can direct people through our workshops to our counsellor. But I'm also a community partner with Birmingham Centre for Arts Therapies. So anybody who comes into our workshops that I that presents with, you know, greater need than we can offer in our workshops. At the time, we signpost them to Birmingham Centre for Arts Therapies and they can access music, dance, drama and art therapies through them. Okay, next slide, please. So yeah, what's up? Next slide, please. You can see from the slide in my personal experience, these things are life changing and the research around trauma filter into popular culture let alone to the people at the dishing out end of medical and helping professional care so what I found is through my master's degree I've learned about trauma read books on trauma articles and the kind of experiences I'm having with psychiatrists counselors GPs are that I I seem to know more about trauma. I'm not saying that I'm a you know special expert or anything, but their limited knowledge and their limited training is making me feel quite uncomfortable about talking to them about my own PTSD and traumatic experiences. So if we could go to the next slide, please. In the States, people are getting huge success from using MDMA assisted therapy, which actually helps people to reflect and integrate their experiences because it helps people to reflect and activate a part of the brain that becomes more um, self about self awareness. So in trauma, people's sense perceptions are all broken up and shattered, and it's hard for people to create a narrative. So when you're trying to talk to a counsellor about these things, we end up talking but not processing and integrating the trauma. So. I found I'm currently under CBT and EMDR therapy at the moment. It was actually the arts therapy that's helping me process it a lot more um, helpfully. And poetry has also helped me to use metaphor and symbols to create some sort of um, clearing inside myself. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, as I mentioned, Suicide and self-harm are the biggest killer of young people and men in the UK. Okay, next slide, please. And unfortunately, three in four people who commit suicide are actually men. So we need a new way in our care systems to support men, and particularly black men, because they face the greatest inequality in the mental health sector. Okay, next slide, please. Particularly for minority ethnic people, the problems around the pandemic have exacerbated existing traumas. Next slide, please. Okay, so Hip Hop Heals looks at these things and attempts to um, offer alternative treatment to medication. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we want humans to thrive. Next slide, please. I'll let you be mission. And now I'm going to show you a creativity booster pack that I made. We were due to launch. So Haley, if you could uh, switch to the PDF of the booster pack. 
So we were due to launch as a startup last April. I've actually been practicing therapeutic hip hop in my workshop since 2013. So I've been devising a model around hip hop, hero's journey, mythical narrative structure, and creative writing for wellbeing. But what I found is that um, we are battling with a lack of sort of culturally appropriate resources. So reggae is one of the founding elements of hip hop. So Hayley, can you skip across to the intro page of that pack? Thank you. Okay, so I've made this pack with a boost with a youth panel. The youth panel had experience of surviving cancer, self harm, the care system, drug abuse. Okay, next slide, please. They also had experience of dyslexia. Now, I'm a secondary education teacher. I trained in English and drama, and for 20 years, I've done cultural work and work around schools. And one of the things that can create massive um, problems for young people and men is the lack of literacy skills. But it's not that people are unintelligent, it's the way that the school system is geared towards teaching. So what I've done in this pack with youth is draw out lyrics, do creative prompts, and offer three layers of opportunities to in engage. So Hayley, if you could skip forward to any of the pages with the lyrics, and then I'll, I think that's my five minutes, pretty much. So we've made this as accessible as possible, and we wanted it to be something that um, people in prison could use, yeah. people in pupil removal units. So I'll finish with this. This is our board member, David Boomer, who's had 16 number ones in the UK. So we're fortunate to have him on. So he's a dancehall, reggae, drum and bass, jungle MC. And in one of his lyrics, he says, stepping out of the darkness into the light, future's looking cloudy, want it to be bright. Trials and tribulations, duck and weird dive, typical description of the so youth life. Now, hip hop and reggae are reportage of lived experience for people facing inequality, disadvantage and structural racism. So you get the news when the news doesn't get you. We offered creative prompts based on therapeutic creative writing. And I've used these with young people with disabilities, offenders in probation, people in homeless hostels, migrant communities. And it doesn't really matter if you like reggae or hip hop, because there's something you can draw from because it's all about, all about your authentic life experience. So I'll just leave you with that. And if you'd like to contact me to get one of these packs, we've got a hip hop one, we've got a reggae one, and yeah, they're free and I want people to use them and enjoy their work. So knock yourselves out with your groups and uh, yeah, please consider using alternative cultures in your work because you could be leaving out a lot of people like me that don't get representation when we go to arts and health conferences, let alone being stood by our GPs. Thank you. Thanks, Kirs. That's absolutely yeah. fantastic. Loads of brilliant stuff there. And uh, people can find more of that on the Padlet. So thanks to Kirs. And on without further ado to our final speaker, Olatunde Spence. Olatunde is a leading therapist and psychotherapist. So we're really excited to hear about your work. And over to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I just want to tell a bit of a story, really. I think we're thinking about creativity and expression and lived experience. So I think I want to tell you a little bit about my journey to include as much of what's been sort of discussed and shared already on the panel and some of the questions that are being asked. Um, so I started out in this sort of world of work, um, not really knowing what I wanted to do. And at a very early age, I became involved in, was back in the eighties then. Um, sorry, can I just introduce myself at audio description? Sorry, I'm a, um, a, a black woman of Jamaican and English heritage and wearing a blue linen shirt with a biker jacket and um, some uh, a pair of glasses and I have uh, sort of shoulder length dreadlocks. Um, and I've got some artwork behind that is some of my artwork from when I used to do lino printing. Um, yeah, so yeah, so telling that story. So I started out at 18 um, as a sort of young activist around anti-racism and the, the, the point I came into that work um, not only from being a child of um, black heritage and my dad was a trade unionist. Um, so I kind of came into the world with a kind of level of activism or understanding about the world and the news, things like that. And my dad migrated to the in 1955. 
Um, so I sort of started in not wanting to have a job in terms of what my parents did as jobs because they were, you know, working in factories and I just, just didn't kind of know there were other roles or jobs available. So I got involved as a volunteer in uh, our local CVS and that at that time there was a, a, a movement within the local uh, council voluntary service sector to, to adopt a statement of anti-racism. So that's where my journey begins in terms of tackling race and inequality. And, and I, I'm sort of starting there because I want to tell the journey of where I become an art therapist and why these issues are so, you know, very live and very important, particularly around issues of trauma and people um, experiencing trauma and trauma in general in, in, in life. So I, I started out in that role um, as an activist and in a, in a a process that was about the, the CVS and the person who was the chair at the time just being really unwilling to adopt this, this statement on anti-racism. Um, so I was part of a working group. I had the, this wonderful opportunity to go to London. Again, as a very young person, you know, not kind of been many places. Went to London, learned all about the, the, the statement and why it was important. Brought that back to what was traditionally a kind of very older, white populated, very middle class CVS and said, this is great. Everybody was on board. It was part of a working party. And at the end of these meetings where we recognised that the, the person who was at that time the chair, I think he was the chair, and that, that, that he was not willing to adopt the statement. So simply, I just said, being quite naive and probably provocative, but what, not really understanding that, was what if he can't accept it, then surely he has to resign. I thought that was a fair, fair thing to say. There's this look of shock on the kind of I guess his friends and colleagues' faces of like, you know, for me set, making this statement. So a few weeks later, we had our AGM and lo and behold, he stood up at the AGM, resigned, uh, went to the press the next day and, and talked about, you know, I was being asked to put my hand on my heart on the Stockport bandstand and say that I wasn't a racist. So that was my sort of start really into something that um, in terms of being able to speak out, say something where I didn't really know what I was saying. And actually see some real some you know some strong sort of action oh well, i'll do that again <laughs> so basically i've lived my life really i think from that point has been a really sort of staunch activist um around uh, challenging racism i have been a youth and community worker i've been involved in black history month work um i've been part of uh, sort of black politics in terms of developing ideas around pan-africanism so i've got a very solid background in um, understanding the way the world works and also in challenging racism when, when I met with it. So that was my sort of journey into community and youth work. You know, I've been an organiser of Black History Month events. Um, I've worked with bringing communities together in an in a area that would be described as predominantly white that didn't recognise them were Black residents. So over sort of 20 years of working in Stockport, I managed to um, sort of begin um, developing Black History Month projects, which then brought communities together to talk about the issues that were affecting their lives. That was the vehicle, really, not, not an end in itself. So I worked for a long time as a community development worker, um, and part of that work, when I was interested to hear that question, you know, how many of the panel have worked in galleries? I also have had the opportunity to work in galleries, um, and I conducted some research for Tate Liverpool to actually look at um, developing Black participation. So that research, um, culminated in take, sort of taking some um, new direction. They looked at employing sort of people who were like trainees or students from, from different communities to, to increase their the visibility of black people in the workforce. They also continued with some exhibitions that they put on from uh, an American, black African-American artist. Um, but a lot of that work reveals what some of the issues were for those communities who live very close to Tate Liverpool. And some of them are really simple things like there isn't a bus that goes directly there from where we live. Yeah, there is an, um, a sense of feeling well, you know, people get followed around the, the gallery like we're going to steal something. One of the other things that it uncovered, which, again, they were completely unaware of, that a lot of the black communities and particularly African and African Caribbean communities did not want to go to the docks area because that was a reminder of when they worked there under those awful conditions. So it revealed a lot of stuff. So not just about the gallery and the space, but all the kind of social aspects that people were experiencing um, in, in coming to, to galleries. Um, as part of that work, I also do a programme that would um, 
It was built on, they had a, a course called Opening Doors, and I wanted to do something similar for black workers. So thinking, how can we use galleries in the work that we do as social workers, probation officers, youth workers, and then to look at whether or not that was something that black workers would engage. And also what was their experience of coming to do that work with me? We're we looking at stuff on the walls. Is it relevant? Does it relate? Are we included here? Um, as somebody who spent a lot of time in galleries visiting and museums, you know, I walk into some of those galleries and I'm thinking about trauma where the real felt sense of the charm that, that's, that's within those objects. So when I see something that's been stolen from somewhere else or collected from somewhere else, there's a whole energy that are behind these objects about where they came from, yeah? who were they taken from, who, you know, and who decided they should play them a certain kind of way, devoid of any context of the people that actually created these objects. So I feel like I come with a very sort of broad experience of the kind of arts and culture and wellbeing um, uh, um, field. Uh, as a result of being a community developer working for a very long time and in the area that I worked, I faced burnout, um, exhaustion, um, huge amounts of stress. Um, and I would say that a lot of that stress came from that sort of defensive um, sort of practice of my colleagues um, and people that were, and it continues to, and that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today. Um, so thinking about the work that I do as an art therapist, um, I was really interested when, when Esther um, you know, you, you talked about sort of middle English word and what that means when we talk about care. And it's about care, concern, anxiety, grief, sorrow, trouble. So th these are things that we know uh, in terms of me working as a therapist or just connecting with people, not even working as a therapist, just connecting with people. I know I, I really like the idea that, you know, psychotherapy is the midwife of the soul. Yeah. So, you know, our, our human connections are really important. And I, and I found that in all of my work, I was meeting with people who had, you know, grief and concerns and troubles. Some of that was channeled into, you know, very politically active um, sort of uh, responses, but others actually just taking care of people at that point. Um, so a lot of the work I did in Stockport was around supporting young people around their identity issues, developing a positive black identity. Um, and that was the sort of beginning of my work in terms of how I work as a therapist, thinking, what, what is it that matters? Where am I presented as, as a trainee therapist in this world? Well, I wasn't. You know, I struggled through all my art therapy training and what I felt what was happening. And, and I know people can kind can, of can really connect with this, that you had to do double the work. I had to learn all about the Eurocentric perspective and then had to learn about, well, what does that mean from a black perspective? And then bring all of that together to actually write a piece of work in relation to what, what I was um, experiencing or thinking about in terms of practice um, as a therapist. So that in itself is exhausting. And again, that is not recognized. When we talk about lived experience of racism, that is not recognized. I have to, that, you know, for lots of black students, you're doing twice the work um, to be seen as, as good as everybody else. Um, so as a result of that experience, I, I, I you know, brought these issues to the course and all of my work was um, from a black perspective and wanted to continue to develop that in terms of thinking about, well, what is this course delivering uh, around these issues? At that point, there was one input on race and culture. And that was it. So it's been kind of my mission, really, I guess, to think about how do we skill up and support and train the next generation, not only therapists, and when we think about arts and culture, also the facilitators, the coordinators, the people who create those works. And what I found, and it may be that it, you know, things have moved on, I'd be surprised if they have, but what I found is that when you go into a gallery, and it's very visual, there are mostly white middle-class people working in galleries. So if, for instance, I go into a gallery and I'm very upset by something that I've seen, who's going to want me to think about that in terms of a context of racial injustice, of racial trauma? And these are the things, although, so even though, you know, I think uh, Baby Jay talked before about actually looking at objects, who's taking care when we go into these spaces? Who's taking that care? Um, so again, as working as a therapist, I, you know, I, I really was interested in what you had to say, kids, about trauma. And, you know, we're just... Just what's, what's happened over the last couple of days in terms of the trial. This has been going on for decades for black people. That racial trauma does not diminish by the fact we've now got somebody who's going to be convicted. We're exposed to it on a regular basis. We're trying to keep up with what's happening in the news. You know, and what we're seeing is, 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 is death, killings, maimings, injuries of our communities. And who's taking care of that? You know, I often say to people, and certainly to my children, careful what you watch because there's some things you cannot unsee 
And that's something I think we need to be thinking about when we're actually moving through these spaces at this particular time of heightened issues where lives matter protests are, you know, on the on the uh, news daily, but also the, the fallout of people who never got to be at those events, the people who are no longer with us, the generations that have passed, you know, the, the Windrush generation, all those, those are our accumulated racial traumas that are not stopped. Um, one of the issues that I, I recently... Um, and it's quite provocative, really, that I experienced was that I'm part of the BACP organisation and I've been really challenged by some of the language that people have been quite willing to share on Facebook. And it was actually in relation to a particular event that happened in Manchester where a man was tasered in front of his child who was actually left screaming at his side. This was actually not far from where I live. I wanted to discuss this as a point of talking about trauma and community. And what was what I met with was lots of really quite ignorant, but also very racist commentary. It happened again last night when I wanted to talk about racial justice. So there's this silence and a voice that goes on in a very active way by that sort of white fragility and defensiveness that gets played out all the time in different um, scenarios, whether it's either being silenced because people don't want to hear what you're saying, or that when you raise this as, as a kind of in a professional capacity, um, that that's really not want to, not doesn't want to be heard. Now, I know there are lots of different organisations and, and some mentioned who are trying to work towards changing that, but I want to know what is going on. I want, you know, research into what are the experience of trainees on these courses. I've, I've actually developed a survey that I would hope that some institution would have taken up because they would have been very interested in when people feel oppressed and used on training courses while they're learning around their sort of psychotherapeutic skills and knowledge that people are actually experiencing trauma on these courses that is never discussed. So one of my, my hopes is that when we're thinking about um, who we are in these caring professions, are these care professions equipped? Are they confident? Are they competent to explore issues around racialization, racial trauma, racial injustice? Because in my experience, that, that isn't something that, that's, that's changed very much. Thank you so much. I did write this five minutes, but I think I feel like I've covered um, a lot I've wanted to say. I suppose just one last thing, um, and I, I didn't think about slides today, but one of the things I wanted to think about when we talk about mental health is um, actually just change that. Let's talk about mental wealth around mm -hmm. So for me, it's about, you know, our mental wealth can be depleted, but it can also be replenished. And we might be in a position to do that as therapists, as carers, as museums and galleries people. How can we replenish people's mental wealth as a, as a starting point so that people can do well? I think that's a great way to end on it. It speaks to Sandra's point about agency and, and that many of our speakers have picked up on. So thank you and thank you to all our speakers. I'm conscious of time and I know we've only got five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to just take one question. Um, I'm going to take the question that's had the most votes, if that's all right, uh, in terms of our panel. So many apologies to the rest of our panel um, uh, and uh, our audience who have posted questions. We really appreciate that and, uh, and we'll try and get to uh, these outside of the, perhaps within the chat. But um, one question to our panel, it received a lot of votes. It's from Damien Hebron. Many, many of you may know Damien. Uh, he was one of the, the founders of the London Arts and Health Forum and the National um, Alliance for Arts, Health and Wellbeing. So thank you to Damien for his question. And his question is this, would the panel agree established ways of funding and delivering arts and culture have reinforced and exacerbated health and other inequalities? And are there new ideas in culture and health? Are these radical enough to overcome this? Who wants to try and pick that up? Can you just repeat the question again? Because there's quite a lot in there. Um, would the panel agree that established ways of funding and delivering arts and culture have reinforced and exacerbated health and other inequalities? It's really, I guess, the way that arts and culture is funded. Yeah, I'd like to just quickly dive in. Um, first of all, I didn't do the audio description, so I'll just say that I'm of Indian heritage. I've got a Wu-Tang Clan beanie on and a Hip Hop Heels white t-shirt. Um, so I've applied for the Bering Foundation Fund on creative minds and ethnic diversity. So generally, the way that funding structures are in place are exclude, they exclude people um, if you don't have the right language, the literacy, which I talked about earlier, and you don't um, have an organisation to back you with a couple of years of accounts to be able to apply. If you're a startup like me, I'm lucky enough that I've partnered with Birmingham Centre for Arts Therapies and they even the work that I'm doing. So we've been able to apply for that fund together. But even though it's inclusive, it excluded me as a startup. 
but I've worked in the community for 20 years. But because there are nine to five jobs for poets, right? Mm. I don't have a nine to five job and I don't have a business that can sell poetry. So I'm working on a commission basis. So that in itself, as one of the most inclusive funds I've seen recently, is slightly, uh, you know, I don't want to critique it before I've just put the bid in. So uh, leave it there. <laughs> I think a great point as well is about partnership working. Does any of our other panellists want to pick that up? I mean, I, I can sort of add something in, I suppose, about um, do the funding models kind of create exclusion of, and issues within themselves? I think they can do. I think also they can actually be helpful in terms of if... Um, you know, I, th I think there had been a big shift in terms of disabled people's engagement once Arts Council England sort of made demands about the creative case, which was, you know, really holding organisations to account if they weren't really looking at their diversity policies. So I think actually there's a role that funders can really pay, play, sorry, that's a Freudian slip, pay and play. Um, I think there's a, a real um, uh, position for them to be able to say, we're going to be much more stringent in who we give the money to, to really show that they really are meeting this agenda. And it's not just a tick box exercise, but it really is an embedded way that an organisation works. So mm. there's a role where it, it can make it worse, but it could actually potentially make it a lot better as well. Thanks, Esther. I mean, I wonder, John, I'm just thinking now, our next upvoted question that received a lot of votes was about social prescribing. And, and this comes up a lot in social prescribing, you know, the money follows the link worker. Um, it doesn't go to, for example, the provider of social prescribing. And, and, you know, that's the case, I guess, for a lot of arts and health type programs and interventions. Um, John, I wonder if you've got some some comments and thoughts about this in, in terms of a, coming from a funding agency, but also about some of those inequities in, in the way that the funding models work in across these areas. Uh, definitely. So so to take to take the previous question first, um, I mean, it's the pre-election pre period, so I'm restricted on some of the things that I can say as a civil servant as well. But I think definitely the case that you know, most funders can go a lot further in making their funding more openly accessible. That's something that we're attempting to do through the new strategy. Um, it won't happen overnight, I don't think, but it, it's up to the sector and everyone else to hold us accountable for the progress that we make over several cycles. And, you know, I can say in, in terms of all the conversations we're having internally that there's a genuine commitment to that journey. Um, it's important to match, uh, you know, the sort of rhetoric or the good intention with real change and achievement. So let's let's see how that goes. But we're really committed to that. On the social prescribing front, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Bev Taylor from the National Academy has that nice line about all the money is going into travel agents and not into holidays in terms of the money for, for, for link workers, something that we're attempting to tackle through the Thriving Communities Fund and seeing a couple of other places and organisations attempt to address this as well, it is to explore how um, seed funding, whether that's from national lottery funders or other trusts and foundations or other agencies, can trigger the long-term patient investment in delivery of activities from the healthcare system, whether that's primary care network, clinical commissioning group, integrated care system, or whatever. I mean, with thriving communities, in addition to the um, cash grants that people are requesting of us, we, we require that people uh, put on the table a minimum 20% uh, cash match. Actually, across the fund, it's closer to 35% cash match that's been offered and similar in-kind support, so that's positive. We've had a couple of pilots, one in Calderdale in West Yorkshire, which is where I happen to be calling in from, another in London, where the local partners, whether they be councils or CCGs or uh, similar bodies, have more than tripled the Arts Council investment with systemic healthcare investment. So I think that's the way forward, um, but, there's always this challenge around social prescribing. We've got a broad continuum of very, very targeted, devised activity. It's quite sort of resource intensive in terms of 
addressing specific healthcare conditions, but it it could be that the right path for a particular individual might be being referred to a community choir or something volunteer led. So I think there will always be a tapestry of provision, but we have to lever in adequate resourcing for the delivery uh, within that space. This assumption that social prescribing is great because the activities are provided for free, it just isn't tenable. And another challenge that might already be familiar to many organisations might be where you're in a way a mainstream organisation begin to get referrals of a complexity that you're not necessarily set up to meet the needs of. So I remember speaking to one organisation, they're saying, you know, in the last six months, we've suddenly had an influx of referrals from uh, older men with early stages dementia, and we're not sh- we're not sure we have the skills to deal with that. So that balance within the system is really important to get right as well. Brilliant. Well, thanks, John. And uh, I'm conscious we're out of time. Sorry that we didn't get to all of your questions, uh, guys. Um, Please do keep posting them and hopefully you can go to your tables after this session finishes and and continue the discussion. So many fantastic topics that our panellists have raised and so many more discussions that we could be having. Um, So please do keep the conversation uh, going. And thank you once again to all of our fantastic panellists. We're really grateful for your inclusion today. And over back to you, Victoria. Thank you, Helen. And th- and thank you all very much, especially being so open about your own experiences. We really appreciate it. Um, in fact, further to what Olatunde was saying about the impacts of some of these conversations, if, if, uh, if anything's affected you, if you want to have a debrief about any of these conversations, please do get in touch with us via the desk delegate, um, whether it's on a personal or a professional level, and one of us would uh, be very happy to come and meet you and have a chat about anything. Um, This applies throughout the conference, so yeah, do get in touch if anything has come up for you. Um, At this point, we would love to encourage you all to go to the lounge, to uh, the tables, and and carry on the conversation about about all these complex topics. Um, And we'd love you to add your thoughts on this topic to the relevant Padlet, which I'm going to share now in the chat, and possibly so as an alert. And then we'll use those Padlets um, to to sort of try and pick up on some of your conversations when we come back for a plenary roundup. We'd love you to come back into this space uh, for the plenary session at 4 p.m. That's for about half an hour, probably a little bit less, and that will be a roundup with me and, and Helen. And with that, thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy your conversations on the tables. Thanks again to our panellists and to Helen for chairing so brilliantly.